as we say. Um, <laughs> is everybody in the room? I don't know. We can wait a minute or two and use that minute uh, to ask a bit what's the background around in the room. Uh, I don't know, like raise your hand like people that are more like, uh, I don't know, tech background maybe, like people that do programming or just like us in general. Just to have an idea, raise your hand, don't be shy. Oh, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> uh, how many does social sciences or has been doing like, I don't know, international relations, politics in general? Okay, I see a few hands there. And who is familiar with China in general? I mean, I'm language a little bit or just like has been working on China before? One here. Uh, when there, I see a few people at the back, yeah. All right, all right. Well, uh, welcome, first of all. <laughs> we are gonna talk about China from afar, the digital state and its opportunities. Uh, basically, the objectives of this presentation uh, are threefold. First, we want to have a basic understanding of China e-government policies, a better craft of this data policy. Oh, whoa, whoa. okay, I'm gonna be careful. Uh, and learn to navigate China's digital state. So compared to what you might have seen before, this has really like two, three, three big parts. Uh, first, we're gonna do a bit of basic facts because China is, is quite something and it's good to have some insights to how to look at it. Uh, second, we're going to go into the digital state. What is it, the digital state, and what are the data policies of the Chinese government? And at the end, we're going to look, I mean, at the end, it's a good, good more than a third of the presentation. Uh, it's all these kind of databases that do open data in China, and that I hope most of you have no idea about, and that there's actually lots of very interesting information there. So um, first, a quick word about who we are. Um, thanks. Um, ECS Red is the only French investigation service specialized in the contemporary China. Uh, we do politics, we do economy, business, or social monitoring. I mean, we've been working with think tanks, some private companies, governments. Uh, we just give our skills, we just sell our skills in investigation, in language, and just knowing the context. Noah and I both have a few years of experience living in China and working there and we help people understanding what's going on. I think that's pretty much the best way to say it. So whether it's due diligence, whether it's research, uh, monitoring, we've done all this, we're still we're doing it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's who we are at This Is Red. You can find us on our website or on Substack for our articles that are uh, paywalled because yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> we're not like giving all of everything for free, but you can find us there. Right, um, that's a quick one about me, uh, going after a pigeon somewhere uh, in Europe. <laughs> Um, I've been, I've worked on social credit, uh, we can come to back later uh, in my master's degree. I've been doing independent research that is, is this read uh, since 2020. Uh, I don't need to go again on this, like I just told you what we did. Uh, from 2020 to 2022, I've worked in the French embassy uh, in Beijing. I was working on uh, semiconductors uh, industry for the CEO, uh, for those who are aware of it, uh, that was what I was doing. And since March 2022, I've been studying a PhD at uh, the University of Vienna in Austria. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you for being here. So I will just uh, briefly introduce myself and, and then I will let my associate to do the, the presentation. So I, I'm Noe and I'm basically investigating about China for a few years, especially for documentaries, which requires a lot of deep investigation. Uh, to get profiles, and I'm doing a lot of studies about many topics uh, on China. So we are like complementary and working all always together. So I'm uh, I'm letting you the floor now. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So uh, before we actually go into the topic, what I'd like to insist on is that we would like if someone has a question at any point, raise your hand, go to the microphone in the middle, and ask your question. Don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, there are no bad questions, there are only bad teachers, right? So like, really don't hesitate. Raise your hand. If I see you, I'll tell you, go, like, go to the middle, ask your question, and it can be uh, about any slide. You just go ahead, like, I really want this to be interactive, like, that you ask me Q&As, like, any time. Um, so please, please do so. Right, so um, I like always to start with this kind of slide because uh, it's always, you have a China discourse that exists around, right? Like either China is like um, so strong in everything, they are the best planner that there is, they have the best tech on the market, uh, they are going so fast, they are, they are so smart, but at the same time, you will also find all the discourse saying that, oh my God, like, hey, China economy is actually doing bad, or um, 
hey, uh, actually people during don't like the Communist Party or something. So this is the, the, the Schrödinger China memes that is like weak enough to collapse at any moment, but at the same time strong enough to take over the world as they want. Um, and I'd like with this presentation that we go a bit deeper and we understand uh, maybe what's behind this discourse that you might have seen necessarily online. Uh, right. I hope that this slide is not going to, uh, uh, <laughs> that most people know like what's on this slide. This is really the basics of the basics. So if you don't know yet, like China has been ruled by the Chinese Communist Party since 1949. Um, Xi Jinping, the current um, secretary, general secretary of the party, has been in power since 2012. Um, now, the next two things are a bit more tricky. Um, in political science, we said that China is an authoritarian state. I don't think I need to define that, like it's a dictatorship. Uh, but yet, there's a slight paradox here, it's actually a very decentralized state. Uh, and it has a very complex bureaucracy. And now you might ask what I'm meaning about this, I'm meaning this. That like, if you look at Chinese bureaucracy, that's what it looks like. It has actually these very complex structures, uh, with each layer of government, national, provincial, municipal, and also ver that's the horizontal and the power, as, uh, as, we, as we call it, like the quiet, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you have a vertical one. What does that mean? And this is very important for everyone to understand because this is a really key thing about Chinese bureaucracy. It is that if you take the municipal bureau one on the bottom left uh, layer, what the okay, what that actually no, no, is, what that means is that like municipal bureau one on the bottom left, has actually two bosses, the municipal government and its direct upper echelon uh, provincial bureau one. And why, you, you might ask, like, why am I talking about this? Because this is the, the, the really quintessential question about Chinese bureaucracy, is that one organization has two bosses at the same time all the time. So if provincial bureau one gives an order that is contradicting municipal government one, like municipal government, who does municipal bureau one listen to? And then you see the problem. That means that like, well, they might actually do different decisions based on many different behaviors. And so this thing, this idea that there's like a double line of command makes it that the Chinese bureaucracy is, I wouldn't say unpredictable, but like there is a lot and a lot of conflicts going on in all the time. Well, we can take example, like if for example, uh, we have uh, Municipal Bureau 1 is uh, Environment Protection, uh, Protection Bureau. And their job is to protect the environment. And so their bosses, Provincial Bureau 1, say, hey, look, we have to shut down these factories that are, that are polluting too much. But then municipal government is saying, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, we need this, this, this factory because it's bringing in this job. So you can't shut it down. Then you see a bit what the, how the problems unfold. There's like this constant contradictions at the heart of the system that makes it well, very complicated in policy implementation, as we call it in political science. But really, I'm insisting on this because this prism of analysis, or however you call it, is really, really important to understand how things are going on in China. There is always conflict, there's always conflict of interest, and um, some central government orders might be contradicted by lower level governments. All right, is, I haven't lost anybody here, like you're still with me? because like, this is starting very intense, all right? This is like a small like, uh, uh, roundup on what that means, right? There's this uh, two direct bosses, that's pretty much what I uh, introduced. Uh, now let's talk about the Chinese Communist Party. Um, well, big thing, right? I mean, there are 98 million members in the Chinese Communist Party. Take a minute to understand what that means, 98 million. Uh, but actually, we, if you look in details, you have only like 500,000 what is called like leading cadre, that is, the actual elites of the elites. These are the guys that are actually having positions of power in the system. And 500,000 is not that much when you think about it for a country that is that big. But yet, the Chinese Communist Party, um, yeah, please. When, when you say member, it's like me if I take my card in a political party in France, or is it different? Oh yeah, it's different. Um, for example, most of the time it would start around university. Um, that's the best moment to get in. And the process is quite complicated, actually. You would have to uh, first apply, you would say it's time for a resume, but then you would have like interviews, you would have to write essays saying, oh, why do I want to join the party? Um, am I like, why do we have this love for uh, what the party represent that is modernizing China, making China better? I mean, I don't want to go into details of like, what is the CCP doctrine, but the idea is like you have, it's a long process and there are uh, multiple interviews, essays that you have to write and not everybody can get into the party. But then it's kind of a job that you have. 
It depends. Um, it can get, uh, like, for the leading cadres, yes, that's the job. For others, uh, if you're just a member, well, you're just going to participate in what they call study sessions, that you're going to study, like, Xi Jinping's speeches or uh, new documents that are out. And basically, your bosses are going to explain you why this speech is important and what you should learn of it. It's not like you can make your own interpretation of it. No, no, no. It's like you have to understand what is the official interpretation of the speech of the boss. You know, and so like it's but like if you're just like a rank and file, so to say, like you just like go into the I don't know Communist Party in French, you all you're gonna participate in some meetings, you're gonna learn stuff, but uh, as long as you pay your fees, you're gonna be fine. Um, but yeah, I wanted to say like the the second point uh, that is that uh, with this 19 million members, uh, well, the Communist Party mm, is actually achieving pretty impressive uh, grassroots level. That is, they are really woven into social fabric at the community level. That is. Uh, picture yourself that if you live in China, um, even if in a, in a village, districts, like residential housings, they are organized in grid, in blocks, and all these grids have a party chief. And so meaning that like you, like, for example, I lived in China during COVID, you live in a, in a community, in a big city, there are four doors. At each of these doors, there is like a security guard that is like paid, I don't know, like 20 euro a month or something, I'm exaggerating. And this guy can tell you, no, you can't go out because now it's zero COVID, you cannot go out. And this guy is taking his orders directly from the party chief of the residential unit, as they call it. So it's really woven into the fabric. In the companies, in the same. In the companies, um, you have a member of, like, of the chief of the party branch of the company. Now, it doesn't mean that like, this, the party is a hive mind. It doesn't mean that, like, oh, wow, like the boss says something, everybody implements it. But it means that if there is something specific to be acted upon, there is a chain of command going from top to down that can, to some extent, implement these decisions. That's what I mean by woven into the social fabric. And therefore, that's the last point, China is a party state, that's how we call it, but the party is always superior to the state. At the end of the day, when in a public administration, let's say the Ministry of Finance, the boss of the, ministry of the Minister of Finance has an idea, but the party chief of the Ministry of Finance says, no, no, we're gonna do differently, the party chief wins. That's what it means. Right, so if we go a bit in this key political trends to keep up in mind, like this, lacking a word, but like, um, I have this thing in mind, um, Xi is no Mao. You probably have seen this, like, oh wow, Xi Jinping is Mao Zedong or whatever, no. Um, Xi is indeed the most powerful Chinese leader that has been since Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao Zedong passed since 1976, so there's been some time upon that. Um, but yeah, Xi is no Mao, and for one reason is that C hates instability. He hates it. It's like you really don't want to see him. He's allergic to it. Um, and Mao was the kind of guy to unleash a cultural revolution because he, feel, he felt that the party, the party was not loyal to him anymore. So he literally threw his own country into a civil war because he felt he wasn't in power anymore. And so that's pretty much the country of what Xi does. Xi is all about ideology and discipline. What does that mean, ideology and discipline? It means that... Um, Basically, she believed that um, the party should be in charge because China cannot do without like a communist party, and that this communist party is about modernizing China. It's about making China strong, and so you have to be disciplined to achieve this objective. You have to keep in mind that okay, yeah, we as a party we cannot allow any like substantial debates about what the country should be or how it should be led. No, we are the party. We're doing that way. If you're not happy with this, you're gonna get fired. And it's not like being fired, you get like unemployment. No, it's like you're gonna get fired and you might have some um, jail issues afterward. So uh, since she has been in power, he has been really hardening the system. That's really how we put it. It's like he has been saying, okay, we need to be strong. We need to face the US. We need to have like an organized, disciplined communist party that can bring China forward, implement our policies, modernize the country so we can stand up on our ground and be like, the first or the second power on earth, like that's up to everyone to decide. Like I wouldn't pretend to know what is in C's ahead, but what's for sure is that the idea is that the party needs to be strong. Keep in mind one thing, the Chinese leaderships are paranoid about the idea of losing power. They've seen the Soviet Union, they've seen the Soviet Union failing, so to say. They do not want that. And so for not having a scenario like the Soviet Union, they need a strong party. That's what was said. Am I like, did I, did I not follow anyone? Is there any question at this point? I can continue forward? All right, all right, let's continue. So uh, yeah, in the Xi era, everything is about security. Um, he developed like this 
comprehensive national security concept that now comprises 16 types of security. And in the latest party congress, which is like, kind of like when they elect the Pope in the Vatican, it's a bit of the same idea. Uh, you have like the whole party uh, elites that is joined together and decide to elect the higher echelon of the party. And they have this work report and that is written by she basically. And she said, we now need to balance development with security, which means that stability comes first, security comes first, and well, economic development, meh, we, we, we first want to be stable. And to give you an idea, the Merix, the German did this very inf uh, fun infographics showing you all these types of security that you can have. So well, political security means that like the party stays in power, but then like territorial, I don't need to explain, military, blah, 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 yeah, it's fine. But then you have, hey, oh, cybersecurity that she had it there. It's like, hey, we need to have like a very secure cyberspace. Um, he also introduced, I think they call it biological, but now there's like agricultural security, which means like, hey, we should be self-reliant in food. And to give you an example to how that translates in policy, um, I think it was this week, right, when they decided to uh, basically raise some forest in the country because they need more land for agriculture. So yeah, let's destroy our forest, but let's plant more corn or whatever crops that they need. Uh, but that is that in Xi's China, security is really, really paramount. Like, you have, we have to be secure. We have to be secure, like, in front of the risk, like, facing the US, facing the West, and so on. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, like, I'm, I'm going at the end of my basic facts section. Uh, so, like, I would like to uh, just sum up. Um, I think what I should, should remember from this is, like, party state is a very complex bureaucracy that has many conflicts into it. Like, there's, like, lots of different strength that is conflicting each other all the time. But the Communist Party is here, it's hemmed in the state. It's the party that ultimately decides. And with Xi in power, well, the party is making itself stronger. Uh, and these are really these things that really we should keep in mind when we look at China, is that like, yeah, they might sometimes say they're open, sometimes they are more or less open, doesn't matter. The point is that like, they want to be feel secure, which means self-reliant, which means strong enough to face the US, which means like uh, not allowing any dissent, Security. That's what to remember. Oh, yeah. Now I'd like to go into the idea of the digital state. And you probably have seen that, like this kind of say, oh, wait, hey, is China like the new digital totalitarianism? Yep, I see someone like at the back now, is it? Oh, wait. No, uh, it wasn't the question. I thought someone had like his hand up. Um, um, yeah, you've probably seen that, like, oh, wow, China is like, I mean, you probably, some of us, uh, some of you have heard about social credit system. We're probably going to come to this later if you want. That's what I study, but like it's really at the end. Uh, but this idea that, like, oh, China is the ultimate dictatorship. Nothing stands up to them. Well, actually, digital state is not only that. I mean, digital state is what we have in France, right? It's like open data. It's like having accessing public uh, services online. And actually, well, China does it too. But it started a long time ago. How many of you are familiar with cybernetics? I mean, this concept, like, I don't know if you've heard about like cybernetics before, like, um, at the end of the Second World War, when this scientist, um, what was his name, Wiener or something like this, uh, guys that worked like sometimes on the, on the rocket science and so on, um, they, were, they had this idea that, hey, um, what if society could be a giant like feedback loop and we'd like kind of organize society like you organize a computer? Like, it's all like, it's all these feedback loops and it's like a system of a system, it's system engineering. So if you act on one of these gear, well, you can just basically act on upon the whole system. And this actually, was very popular, like one of prominent thinkers of this cybernetic trends was Chen Xue Sen, the guy on the, 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 guy on the left. Um, his story is a bit sad, I mean, sad for the US in the sense that like, he was a scientist in the US, a brilliant rocket scientist. He was like making rockets and missiles and so on. But the US accused him to be a communist spy. So they exchanged him um, to the Chinese, uh, they, they sent him back to China in exchange for uh, US prisoners of war. And when he went back to China, he basically, not alone, but he created China's nuclear program and uh, rocket program. And he was also like really fans of cybernetics. And Song, Jiang, uh, Song Jian, sorry, the guy on the, on the right, was a student. And when I say that the cybernetics had really impact, these two guys, again, not alone and not like on their own orders, but they basically created the one child policy. Um, because in their idea, like one child policy was like this, hey, well, like, we have an overpopulation problem and like it's impairing the development. So if people have less child, well, everything's gonna go better. And in a very like system engineering fashion, like, well, maybe we can act on this thing, the natality to make everything better. So that is to say that there is a long story where like in the 70s, uh, the 70s, the early 80s, and there were people already thinking about like cybernetics, digital states and so on. 
put that one further. Um, do you know Alvin Toffler? I mean, this is like the kind of guy that was doing like um, the new revolution, the, infor like, the information age. We're like in the late, the mid 80s, early 90s. Um, this idea that, well, you know, we are post-industrial societies. Now it's all about, they're gonna be about information. And to be frank, no many, no serious scholars in, in Western countries were taking him that seriously. Uh, I mean, he was a bit like, what's his name? Um, uh, it could be like the Bernard Henri Lévy a little bit uh, in, in some aspect. Like not, not that many people took it seriously. But in China, in China, he had actually meetings with top leadership. Like when I say top leadership, it's like the president at the time, the secretary of the Communist Party is like number one, number two of the country. They really wanted to meet this guy because they were like, hey, we missed the previous inter uh, industrial revolution. We are like quite backwards industrially. But if we get this, if we get into this new technological revolution, we might be first. So in the 80s, the Chinese leadership were already thinking like, oh wait, let's put forward like some scientific program to uh, study networks, to study computers, to understand the information revolution. So I couldn't help but put the nuggets because of course when you put this kind of thinking group, you have people thinking that, hey, uh, maybe for the 100 years of the Chinese community, for the, for the People's Republic of China, we can clone people and have like a reenactment in the old one. I mean, there are always people that go too far. But the point of this slide is to show you that they have been thinking about information for a long time. Like, this is not like, they haven't woke up yesterday, so like, oh wow, this internet, that's Google, that's nice. No, it was on in the 80s, 90s. Um, so there's already early digital state projects at the time. Um, you probably have heard, for some of you that are a bit interested in China, of the Golden Shield, that is basically the ancestor of the Great Firewall. But it's a Great Firewall being the, the censorship system that basically makes it that if you want to go to China, you need a VPN to access most of foreign websites. Uh, but there's actually 12 of these golden projects, so to say. So you had, for example, the idea of a government tax information management system, custom administration, social security. The idea was to create, just like we could have in France, uh, uh, the, an internal digital system for la CAF. I don't know, but like, that was a bit of the idea, right? But that's like early 90s already. And it kind of worked. I mean. Who can say that the great firewall doesn't work in China? But it had a problem, is that it increases silo. Like, remember the slide about the, the bureaucratic layer? It increased the vertical part. It made like one bureaucracy, for example, if we continue on the golden shield, the golden shield is the, is the Ministry of Public Security, it's like the, in, the Ministère de l'Intérieur, Ministry of Interior. Well, this guy got really powerful and they didn't want it to share the data with anyone. And so this is a bit of what is a recurring issue is that like when you're very vertical, then you have no incentive to work with others. So these projects of the early digital state worked out, but it also made the bureaucracy very independent from each other. Later on, we had other initiatives. Like, I mean, I'm gonna go fast on this, except like, I mean, please, like, I don't see much questions for now, but like, I'd, like don't be shy. Please ask questions around. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm gonna insist on this all along, but like, I don't know if you have any questions, Please raise your hand. Um, yeah, well, I'll continue anyway for now, but just, um, you had other initiatives like online government or sunshine government. The idea was, yeah, to uh, basically bring the government online. I think that's pretty much straightforward. That is that you can access government administration with a uh, like just going on, a, on the website. Uh, then you have like the sunshine government. This idea was like being transparent. I know this sounds like a bit weird to China, but we're gonna go back to this, but like, yes, they are like, hey, Maybe government should be a little bit transparent so that you know we can access government data online, and keep that in mind. It's going to be important. But yeah, um, that's some literature. But I think that like if some people record the slide, they can look at them later. But there's some interesting um, uh, articles to look at. Um, now we are like in the early 2010s, right? Because like I was like before it was like the 2000s. Now we are like in 2013. And what happened in 2013 in China is that there's company that you might have heard of, like Alibaba, like Tencent, that started to get very, very big. And the government looked at it. The guy on the right here is like the previous prime minister, it's like Li Keqiang, and on the left, uh, for those who know, it's like Ma Yun, the head of Jack Ma, the head of Alibaba. And well, this prime minister at the time, uh, he was in power until last year, he really thought that like tech company was more effective than the government at managing large organization. It's like, hey, what's, what's going on? Like, we're the Chinese government, but tech companies are doing it better than us. Um, maybe it's time to learn about this. And like, we're around 2015, 2016, and it's the time of the great plans. Like, you probably have heard of like Made in China 2025. 
yes, no, I don't know, like, like probably heard of this, like this idea that like China should be the greatest industrial power. You probably have heard also about plans like making China the most advanced AI economy in the world. Well, this was at this time, you know, it was like the big data crave. Like everybody was like, oh my God, like big data is a new oil. And well, the Chinese government thought like that as well. It was like, hey, wait, um, these tech companies doing very well. We should do the same. So they start to learn from the private sector. And I'm going to give you an example. This is my, I mean, I'm not registered, but this is my personal Alipay. And this is um, MD program, like just like a small program on Facebook that gives me access to government uh, services. So on the left is different services. Like, I mean, I don't know. The first one was like, well, the first one is like the, the digital uh, uh, carte vitale, uh, the, the, the uh, social insurance card. You have like uh, some access to your uh, fund for buying houses from like primary school results or like, uh, like uh, uh, enrollment for your kids. Point is, this is like, it's not even a government app. This is embedded into Alipay, which is Alibaba's main application. And so like, this is like, you, you can just do it. Like, you know, it's, that's, that's it. That's how it works. And, um, and this is an example of digital state. Yeah, that's like China nowadays. I mean, you know that people pay with the phone, but you can also access government services through Alibaba. Um, so where we are now, that's a good question. So government digitalization, the idea of having the government online and having services online is still a key objective. And in, yeah, as we're going to see, it's going well. But there's two imperatives behind, behind this. First, digital economy creates value. Second, well, political, well, digital governments uh, is more efficient. Like, I mean, it's more efficient than paper, right? Like, who does still like paper? Like, who goes at the cuff to give the paper yet? Um, so it kind of works out. Indeed, the efforts are paying off. We will come to this later. I'm going to show you some databases. but. China is actually quite digitalized. You have like so many databases of government data that are accessible to you and I. Um, and the administration, like when I go there, I never go to the administration for having my, my I don't know, my paperwork done because you can pretty much do everything online. But this also brings problems <laughs> because when you have a lot of data online, you're going to have problems. And um, like, you no, know, I think like now, um, did some of you heard of like Temu? It's like this new like online buying uh, app that is I think like now selling in the West. I think it's the Chinese, the, the, the Western equivalent in Pinduoduo, which is one of these online selling uh, company. And you might have heard of Pinduoduo for one reason is that not so long ago, there was a report on how predatory Pinduoduo was to users data. They was basically like taking everything that was available on your phone and they were just like finding ways of keeping your phone unlocked and, and just like taking everything that was, that was existing. These predatory habits from companies, they're just common. They just like this is the rule. And there is this black market for personal data that just like, yeah, people just buy data online because, well, that's how it is. And for a few hundred bucks, I mean euros, you can get thousands, if not dozens of thousands, of complete personal records from people because they're just like there's a black market for that. And then you have the extreme cases that I guess most of you have heard that like last year, a police database was left open for a year on the internet with one, more than one billion personal information on it. And I mean, <laughs> that's, that's kind of bad, right? It's the police. But just, yeah, like that's, that's what's the problem of the digital state. So which brings me to the next part, how does the state deal with it? And um, now in this part, before we start, we can make a small break, we can ask some questions, but like I'm gonna then introduce who are the big players the, the administration and what is the policy. But before that, is there any question? <laughs> uh, I, I see someone, yeah, no, but like, I, 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 I want questions, I want questions. En français, si ça te dérange pas. Pas de problème. Uh, tu es passé assez vite sur le fait que c'est uh, pyramidal. Ouais. Et juste uh, pour uh, dans des documentaires, peut-être uh, que ton collègue a participé, mais. Il insistait sur le, la place de l'oligarchie et des familles, euh, des premiers euh, éléments du Parti communiste, des, des familles des fondateurs. Et je me demandais euh, s'il n'y avait pas un petit peu de quoi balancer la, la rivalité entre le privé et le public que tu as un petit peu... C'est pour toi, ça C'est pour moi Oui, donc la question était... Well, we know that China has a lot of rich people, and does that like the rich people power actually balance um, well the the state and the party's power? And um, actually, it's a good question because for a long time, you know, well, we have been in this idea that hey, if China gets rich, well, they're going to get more liberal, they're going to get democratic, like right? Isn't that like how the world works? No, I mean it wasn't obviously, and uh, but it's still a good question because 
actually, uh, now lately we know that there's like a lot of rich people that are trying to leave China. But remember this like 500,000 leading cadres that I've mentioned? Well, these people are not the rich people themselves, but many of them, their wife's brother is the head of Y, I don't know, X or Y state-owned company. And believe me, they are making a lot of money. I mean, you're right to mention that China is a bit oligarchic because at the end, well, I mean, of course, party elites are making a lot of money. I mean, to give you an idea, we always say in France, like, oh, wow, like in France, like with, uh, what is it, like 50 or 55% of the, of, the, of, the, of the GDP is like social services, like social money and so on. Well, I mean, in China, 55 or 60% of the economy is, of the GDP is state-owned economy, enterprises. So meaning that this is money that is quite accessible for leading cadres or rich people in the system that are often in positions of making decisions. So yeah, like the, the, the thing is like, I, don't, I wouldn't say that ch rich Chinese families or people have an interest in going against the party because they became rich because of the party, you know, like they, they, they benefited from the party's policy to get rich. So actually, they, they are both like very happy about it. Of course, you can find now example after the lockdowns and, and like rich families from Shanghai or whatever that are putting money abroad. But putting money abroad is one thing. They can put money in Singapore, Hong Kong, on the US or Canada and buy houses there, but they are still going to get loyal to the party. There is no contradiction here. I mean, it's, there is like common jokes in China that saying like, only for the common people, it's forbidden to have two passports. But if you're rich, you can have five. You know, <laughs> just like that's like the, that's a bit of how, how it works. Yeah. Uh, any other question? I, I hope I answered yours first of all. No. Yeah, all right. Let's continue. Right. So let's look at who are the key players in the Chinese digital scene and what is the job. Hey, <laughs> these guys. This is like the Central Cyberspace Affairs Commission. This is basically a small leading group. I'm going to go very quickly on this one. But these are the guys, this is directly led by Xi, and he's deciding um, what should be cyber, uh, I mean, he's not deciding alone, but basically big political decision will go through him, through this group, uh, the, the Central Cyberspace Office Commission, and this is where they decide what is the cyber policy. And these policies are implemented by this guy, you probably have heard of them, the Cyberspace Administration of China. I mean, we say yeah, they are the bad guys because, I mean, yes, they are the ones that have the enforcement power. They are the administrative arm of this previous commission we just saw. And they are in charge of internet content regulation. That is censorship. That is to make sure that, like, on social media, there is nothing that um, is going to um, contradict the party's line. And I'm just going to do a line on the censorship to get you an idea on how the censorship is done. Um, the state doesn't do the censorship in China. Very little. Um, the state addicts rules, most of them are not public, on what should be or should not be discussed on social media. But then it's private companies, social media companies themselves, who are doing the moderation, as we call it. And um, basically, it's like tens of thousands of employees, because they can't, do, they can't use AI for everything. And uh, these companies have uh, objectives. That is, that, like, let's say, for example, you are the head of Weibo, China's Twitter, and you're too slow to delete some harmful news that is going around. Well, you're going to get a fine and you're going to get problems because it's your job to make sure that people don't see this bad news that the state doesn't want you to see. But that's an interesting thing. So the CAC, what is their job? Is that to edict these rules of what should be or should not be public on the Chinese internet. But they are not going to do the censorship themselves. This is the company that is going to do it. So they managed to externalize it. And for the state, it doesn't cost that much money. However, if you're Weibo, if you're like WeChat, well, then it's your investment. And you better invest that money because otherwise you're not going to get any market share at all. So yeah, um, also like the, the, the Cyberspace Administration of China are in charge of cybersecurity review. I'm going to come back on this later. That is that they have now the power, like some of you might have heard a um, month ago maybe, uh, Micron, the US uh, memory maker, uh, was uh, faced an investigation from these guys because the product might not be safe enough for, uh, the, uh, for the Chinese market. I mean, we know that this was a ret retaliatory measure that was like, a bit political, but still, this is these guys who, this guy, who decides the kind of things. That's why we call them the buy guys. Then you have the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. They are the engineers. That is, that they are the one that would um, be tasked, for example, they are in charge of the rollout of the 5G infrastructure in China. They would be also in charge of coming up with a certification for cloud de confiance, yeah, like trustworthy clouds. I don't know how you call it in English. But this, this is called Xinchuang, there's these two characters, and now the Xinchuang is mandatory on a 
range of, uh, I mean, state party administration, but also transportation, finance, uh, I think like health, all these industries, they have to have equipment that have this certification. And well, I mean, you might guess it, foreign company doesn't really have this kind of certification. So it's, it's mostly gave for the Chinese companies, obviously. Uh, that's the point of having them. Um, and then you have these new guys, I mean, the newcomers, like, I couldn't help them otherwise, they just, they just came up, like, like in March, uh, when there was like this political event. And yeah, it's called the National Data Bureau, and I can't really tell you that much, because uh, it wasn't very precise at this point. They said that they will be in charge of data regulation and data uh, digital economy policy making. I think that what you can remember of them is that they will be, um, that the Chinese state is trying to give less job to these, because they have really been taking most of the job lately, and to let them do the enforcement and allow this guy to do like the policy making. What I mean policy making is like, oh, let's have this plan to have like, I don't know, like, uh, uh, like we're gonna be the next like uh, data superpower. Like basically they are doing the, uh, yeah, they are doing the drafting and they won't so much do the cybersecurity part. So yeah, there are other actors, but like that would be very long. I mean, there is this national information center. Uh, I could show you the website a bit later on, but they are like this, um, uh, I don't know what's the equivalent in France, but it's like this administration that is in charge of managing all this public data that goes around. So they have like very much uh, ramifications. Well, public security, that's Ministry of Interior. You've probably heard of them because they are like in charge of also the censorship. Uh, and they are in charge of the Great Firewall. Um, the Ministry of State Security, that's like the intelligence service. And then the army, because of course the army does also like cyber stuff. I mean, but this is like, this is more uh, things that are uh, predictable, so to say. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions on this uh, administrations. Yes, I see someone standing up. <laughs> oh, wow, that's very like uh, serious going on. Hello. <laughs> um, we say often that uh, the great favor, because this is a part of that we are going to talk here, is. Uh, a lot of people, one million of people, if I write. And uh, if you explain, if I understand correctly, that's yeah, what you explained, this is mostly an, an administrative work and more or less uh, technical and engineering work. So is the this one million people are just paper workers? Or it's more... Uh, Huge than that. That's actually a very good question, and, and I would be lying to say that I know the, the exact answer because I guess these figures are quite kept uh, private. But that's for sure that there is like I mean, both the Ministry of Public Security and the CAC that we saw oversee part of it in like what, for example, deciding what website should be blocked or not. Then I of course can't tell you because I guess that they also uh, externalize part of the work on. Um, uh, on maintaining the, the, the Great Firewall to companies that does that. I mean, here, like, again, I'm an academic and I work on policy making, so I'm not an expert on how this works technically, but I guess that the telecom providers are the ones that have actually many people doing the work on the cyber, the, the, on the cyber, the firewall and so on. So I guess that this is always like, I mean, the state in China, when you think about it, this is not that many people working the administration. I mean, at the most, a few million people for more than one billion uh, inhabitants. So they probably managed, for both cost and number of employees' reasons, to externalize this. This is also like something to have in mind. It's like the state doesn't take that much uh, uh, direct share of the of the work. But yeah, I hope I somehow responded to your question as much as I could because I, I don't know everything, uh, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there is something else. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you said that Xi is very focused on security. Yeah. Is he also focused on preserving his security, not as in physical, but his position as leader of the party? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's for sure. Uh, I mean, Noe, we, we you, you talked about it. We worked about we worked on it. Like there is uh, the 20th Party Congress. Again, they elect the Pope, and um, she broke quite of this. I mean, the part the Communist Party is not like an absolute monarchy, right? There are some rules. There are some like um, institutionalized rules that we call them, um, and she broke quite a few. A few. Um, and there is a cost to breaking this rule, right? You need to be powerful enough to say to the other people standing in the room that like, look, I'm gonna do what I want. And yes, I know I break the rules, but you know, F you, like that's what I mean. And so yeah, she for sure has been 
I mean, you've heard also of the anti-corruption campaign that both cleared a lot of very corrupt people in the system, but very conveniently helped replace these people with guys that were maybe most loyal to him, right? So he has been, for the last 10 years, she has been very, very good at securing his power. And I'm not gonna, I can go into all the details about like ideology or other stuff, but keep in mind that yes, he's definitely like really, really, really careful about his own security, like his position in power. There's the army on the back of the slide. Um, when she came to power, the first thing he did was like purge the army. And he kicked out a bunch of high ranking generals that have been institutionalized for a long time. And we've all seen what happened with Wagner in Russia. I'm pretty sure that she was like, I made a good decision 10 years ago. Uh, so I kicked this guy out and uh, I didn't know if they were like safe or not, but I just kicked them out. And yeah, I'm, I'm certain that like he, he's now like, like comfortably going to bed and say, ah, this guy is not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if I, that replied more or less of the question. Mm? Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, I just want to add something on this because this is a topic I, I do really like. Like it seems from the outside that she is almighty for sure and probably is very good as wielding the party in order to put his friends in power. But it's important to remember that he is not almighty. And we found uh, this truth with the, um, with the pandemic, actually. It was a very good occasion for him to replace people he really doesn't like uh, in power, in charge, with high ranks on provinces in China. And some of these guys he really hated. He was unable to replace them because these guys they really handled the pandemic well. So they benefited from the, from the people support and from the local administration support. And he wasn't able to act on this. So it's very important, I think, to remember that this guy, um, the support to him in the party is like a lake. It's very wide because there is no better candidate, but it's n there is no depth. Like, uh, it's not profound. Well, this is my, my view on this. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and really, like, that was really good to say this as well, because I think I agree, and it's not an absolute monarchy. Like, he's, he's the strongest leader since Mao. There's no question there, and he's not going to fall tomorrow. But he's not, yeah, he's not an absolute leader, you know? This is, this is not, like, 17th century Europe or, or something like this. There is other constituencies to deal with. Other questions? Yeah, uh, please, please come forward. Oh, it has been an hour already. Oh, yeah, see, I've seen, yeah. Come, come forward. Uh, hi, uh, I have a quick question about the uh, um, cyber security, uh, spatial thing that makes the sensor. Uh, yeah, the cyberspace administration. Um, does they have interaction with the Ministry of State? Um, uh, the um, state security? Yeah, state security and uh, Ministry of Interior. And those, if uh, they make center uh, of big uh, leading card of the party, uh, how does uh, it work? So uh, I don't have the exact um, uh, view on how the personal is, but you have to keep in mind that these guys are basically directly under the party. Which means that like the, both the Ministry of State Security and the Ministry of Public Security, they are state organs. And remember what I said at the beginning, is that like at the end, the Communist Party decides. And so the Cyber Security Administration, the Cyberspace Administration of China, in the hierarchy, in to say, they're higher because they are, they are directly under the party's leadership. That is not to mean that these two guys are not powerful, like the public and the state security, but there is some coordination. And, I don't have the exact names in mind, but I wouldn't be surprised that basically there is some overlapping to some extent, because you cannot have too much overlapping, otherwise people get too powerful, between people that are in charge of cybersecurity in the cyberspace administration of China, the party organs, and the state organs. So I think that in these regards, they are mostly aligned to each other. But again, not too much, because as Noe said, if imagine you have the same guy that is at the head of the cyberspace administration of China and the Ministry of Public Security. Well, this guy starts to get really powerful because like, he's at the head of the very powerful organization. So if you're she, you don't want to have one guy leading all of this administration together. That's a bit too much, right? Like you don't want to have, like 
the Soviet Union, for example, you didn't want to have one guy heading the Secret Service and heading at the same time, uh, I don't know, the Prime Minister's office, because that's like really a lot and you get very, very powerful in this case. So yeah, to answer your questions, there are some overlapping, but at the end of the day, these guys, well, they, they directly are uh, under the party's leadership, so they are like slightly higher in the administration. Yeah. Right, like it has been already an hour, so I'm gonna go forward. Uh, well, we, I'm going to go a bit faster than this, not that it's not interesting, but like it's very important, but I'm going to go, I, I want to show you some of the database we have because I know that's why you're here as well. Um, so, so, so like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up a bit. <laughs> so yeah, you know there have been a free like uh, data protection laws, um, cyber security, data security law, personal information law. I showed this to show you, two, to remind you two things. First that like, well, again, contrary to popular thinking, Chinese states, cares about personal information private and privacy. Like, I mean, nobody likes to be like the, the product of big uh, internet corporations. I mean, this protects people against the, the companies, not against the state, obviously, but you know, like it's good at least that it, the state has the monopoly of information. So what does this law require? Like data localization here, no surprise. Cybersecurity review, so if you're like a foreign company, uh, and maybe some of you uh, are first, first uh, foreign companies uh, in China, and you have like, I don't know, more than I think a million users, I think there are different thresholds. Uh, well, you are supposed to give some of your codes for your apps of your, of your whatever things you're using, you have to give this to the government in theory. You have to limit data transfer. That is a really big thing, because imagine Tesla, that has plenty of, Chinese, of cars in China, now, like, maybe they might not be able to transfer the data they get from their self-driving algorithm in China outside because that would, like, breach the law on data localization. So that actually has a really problem. Like, it's the same for, for foreign, like, for, uh, like, there are some companies doing pharmaceuticals in China. They try to basically, like, uh, I don't know, like, R&D some, some medication, but maybe they are not ab able to take the results of this R&D out of the country because there is, like, that would infringe the law. And same with algorithm access that we hear more and more nowadays because, I mean, yeah, well, you, you've all heard about ChatGPT, thanks. Uh, but, like, yeah, like the Chinese states don't really like that and they better know what's in this ChatGPT thing. Uh, and there's also a reason why there is no ChatGPT in China yet because now it's not that it can't do it, but most that, like, there is a bit of some regulatory strain on it. Right, so what does that mean? That means that, like, the state of is careful about who access data and access to data becomes complicated, and that's really a problem when you don't work in China. But still, there's considerable amount of stuff out there. Why? Because China still does open data. So I'm giving you two keywords that you can take in pictures because it's going to be helpful for you when you do research in China. Um, like, Xinxi Gongkai on the left uh, and on the right, Shuji Gongkai, which literally means inf uh, open information and open data. And this has been going on a long time, right? I talked before about transparency. Uh, well, they have been thinking about this since the early to mid 2000s. Okay, I, I thought it was like, uh, yeah. Uh, and so there, there is open data in China. And that's a bit of the point of my presentation is to say that like there is a lot of things going on. So it was for different reason. At the beginning, well, remember China accessed the WTO, the OMC, the, the, the World Trade Organization, only in 2001. And they had to be in compliance about openness, about access to regulatory issues, about uh, knowing what companies are doing and so on. So they had to put a lot of things online. And then in the 2010s, the idea was like, hey, um, if we uh, want like people to trust to trust the government more, well, we better have like some government transparency. So um, that was like around 2010, and then I'm going like very briefly on this, but I think this is very interesting because they are now trying to go the, a step further and they are trying to give a value to the data. And I'm promising this is like very. There's two slides about lecture, and then we're going into database, uh, but. They are trying to give value to data, and because they realize at first, like the economy, the digital economy is getting more important than the real economy, and that the government is hoarding huge quantities of data for reasons that we explained before. Uh, so they came up with this thing, data factor, and I'm forced to give you like two minutes of uh, Marxist economic uh, uh, terms, but like. Economy depends on production factor, and it's not only Marxist, but in the Chinese case, they consider they have like uh, four production factors, that is land, labor, capital, and technology. And in 2020, they came up with something new, like, hey, um, actually data are a production factor. That means you can generate wealth from giving a value to data. And this is very interesting in the case of open data, because that means that they are going a step further and they are trying, I mean, 
I'm not that familiar with data's uh, open data practices in France, unfortunately, and I'd like to know more, but like, what's means interesting here is like, while we decide maybe in Europe to put some government data uh, open for uh, companies or associations to use, I mean, that's I think what most of you are doing, well, in China, they're thinking, hey, wait a minute, what if we can assign an economic value to that data? What that like, what if, you know, um, like these can be, this can have like a monetary economic value and introduce the data markets. Uh, the data markets are not a new thing. Like the first one started in 2015 in Guiyang. Like that is, Guiyang is famous for being the city that has the um, iPhones uh, data center and, uh, in China. So they started very early on all this data thing. But it's also these data markets were not that successful and they are not, are, and they still are not. Because remember, I talked a lot about security. And if you're a, a company or a government organization and you put data to sale on official market, but then a year later, government decide that your data is like actually breaching national security law. Oh, well, then you're gonna have problems, you know? So that's a bit of a contradiction again in the system. It's like, yeah, we want to generate value with data, but if I put my data online, am I gonna get like prosecuted because I infringed like national security law? So like they have a slight problem here, um, but it exists and there's a lot of them. So I can take a few examples. So. This is one like I mean I'm I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna just like click on it because like that can show you um, does it is it gonna open it I don't know yeah it's gonna open it um, this is what a data market looks like um, this is like from Guiyang right this is the city I uh, opened and so yeah so here are um, data's oh, unfortunately I'm I'm gonna like cut you on the system right now because um, except if you have like uh, twelve thousand jaminbi that makes like a bit less, like that's 1,500 1, euros, and that you have like, you can register to this, you're not gonna be able to access this uh, uh, like, like this laser uh, localization data service that is for sale. But the idea is still there nonetheless. It is that you have all this data, this is all like company, like for 5,000 UN, for a bit more than 1,000 euro, you can access like uh, uh, a third party certification system for real name identification. I have just a question. Yeah. Is it possible to connect on that with an IP address from France, for example, or do I need a specific VPN to bypass the Great Firewall and which provider? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You've been asking this, and I and I have a slide on that later. But unfortunately, it's not going to answer your problem. So the thing is that for this stuff, for example, you have to buy it. And um, I mean, to be honest, like I'm going to do the test, and it's going to tell me like, hey, uh, do you want to register? And oh well, this is China, you know. Like you have like okay, three things: uh, personal user. Um, uh, like company or government user. And wait, let's see if I can register. Well, I mean, yeah, it's the, it's the usual thing. Okay, yeah, I need to register this. Yeah, I need, you need the Chinese phone number. But besides that, I think you can register otherwise. Like, I mean, I haven't tried it, obviously, because I, I, I never, like, bought this kind of, of, of things. But yes, and, uh, and I think that, like, I'm sure that for many of you in this room, you might find a way to access some of it. Uh, <laughs> but like for me, it's like I'm an academic and I don't <laughs> and I don't have direct use of it for now. But yeah, this is like to show you one, and I can show you another one. Though. So yeah, that was like an explanation. Um, the interesting thing in many of these that this data comes from local state-owned companies that are trying to set it outside. And to be honest, it's a bit ridiculous because this it says that it has been bought 31 times. So it's a bit lame, to be honest. <laughs> and I'm sure that if you know some gray market in China, you can access that for less. But just like, or maybe a bit more. But the point is that like, you know, they are trying something. And I wanted to attract your attention on this because I mean, it's quite interesting, right? We're talking about open data and the Chinese government is trying to put value on open data. I mean, there is something that is like going on that we have might have not think through yet. Okay, that's another one I'm gonna open as well for you to see there's a Shanghai one that uh, really like, automatically looks more fancy. Wait, how does it, how does it work? Um, yeah, so like I'm, go I'm going to Shanghai right now, but this is the same idea, right? So you arrive on the website, um, this is like uh, like the data market, and then you have all these different things, um, how you like register your products and so on, they explain it. Then you have like more like financial services. Uh, this is like uh, maritime transportation services. So basically, I don't know, if you, if you click on this, I'm sure you just like find companies selling, I don't know what kind of transportation data, yeah, uh, Gaodo is one of this, like, it's basically uh, China's uh, Google map. Um, well, public transportation, I mean, you know, like, you can really, you can access some of this. Um, I mean, yeah, 
Like that's like that's for you to have fun. I mean, that's uh, I'm just like showing up some stuff. Um, yeah, to sum up, open data exists in China. There is a new way to use inference data, but there is still a security imperative. So uh, now I think that's what some people have been waiting for. <laughs> I could, I could like, uh, and I'm going to show some of the things that we use uh, for work, but like, yeah, in the in different service, but like show you that there is actually a lot of stuff going on. So the first thing you want to know is this. Um, yeah. So first of all, uh, like all of these, you can access it. I mean, when I say access it, it's like you might not get the full data in because, yeah, I mean, of course, like it's China nonetheless. But you can still go around and find nonetheless some information. Now, geoblocks are really becoming a problem. And I'm sharing you like personal stuff like uh, in, in Vienna for the, for the research program. We are now like really seriously considering installing like um, a VPN to go back into the mainland to do our research. Because like it's getting really, really, really complicated. And for now, we haven't like found the best solution to do it. But I mean, I'm working on social credit system and I want to access some government databases. It just blocks me out. And uh, and so yeah, uh, maybe see if some of you like wants to uh, jump in and share some of the solutions. Uh, like I'm sure this will interest a lot of people. But yes, geoblocks is like really becoming a problem. And for the last thing, for this word about OPSEC in the Chinese context, well, I do not have a solution because again, I mean, we use some stuff when it comes to the company. But like personally, uh, when I do my research. We just do the good old ways, and I think Noah has a name on this, and he's going to jump in. But like, either you ask some people you know, or you buy some fake idea, right? And I think you have, <laughs> you have something to say about this. But just like, yeah, I mean, we are academics, and uh, in my research, I have to sign like the EU funding agreement that I can't do something unethical. So I, 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 I do not buy fake idea, of course. <laughs> That's the thing. But yeah, do you want to jump in on this or not? Like, no, no, no. no, no. Okay, later. No worries. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, so that's, that's really important because yeah, it's a Chinese context and uh, and yeah, I mean seriously, it's complicated. I'm I'm really lucky to have WeChat. I'm really lucky to have Alipay. That sometime I can just like just register with some stuff. But yes, of course, I do it with my, I mean, with my personal info because just I don't have like yeah, that, that's how it works. Like especially for the work, like that's we are we are forced to do so. Um, anyway, I mean, when I say the works, the academic work, of course, <laughs> just like because like we have like actual ethical things that we have to sign. One thing that I want to show you about Baidu, because you might not think so, but Baidu actually has some interesting services. If you go here, there's like a little bit more, you know, on the Baidu page. And here, oh wow, like lots of different services. So you might not be interested in setting ads, uh, but you might be interested in uh, uh, Baidu News, you might be interested in Baidu Pictures, you might be interested in Baidu Image Recognition, you might be interested in, in Baidu Scholars. Uh, like These are stuff that are going to give you some really interesting leads if you do some research in China. Uh, just because like this, all this, you can just click on it and that you don't have to register for that. You, you might have to, you might have full access to some of the results, but I mean, for the academic part, you can find articles like that. And people just forget that, hey, Baidu, yeah, Baidu sucks in general, but sometimes it's always good to start your research by Baidu because you're going to find some, some interesting things. And same with government organization. Uh, Baidu is a system to uh, authenticate uh, Chinese government uh, organization, which means that like, if you would like to go on a state administration of China, but you don't know which one it is, you just type it on Baidu and you're going to find it. Um, Baidu is pretty good for that. Yeah, uh, what else? Oh, WeChat. So as you know, WeChat is an ecosystem, right? Just like Alipay is an ecosystem, just like uh, Douyin, which is the Chinese TikTok, is an ecosystem. And uh, which means that, like, if, well, if you don't have a WeChat, you're going to have some problem. But this is really good because this website, uh, Sogo, Weixin.Sogo, Sogo is a search engine in China, and Weixin is WeChat in Chinese. Um, this allows you to access what they called here uh, articles sent by a public account, Gong Zhong Hao, um, which is basically like, it's like if in WhatsApp you would have, I mean, that's a bit of like Telegram, right? You have like a blogging service, and this is the same. And this search engine allows you to get articles, so it's a bit messy. You can't really order your results the way you want. It's, it's like it's entirely not satisfactory. But without an account, you can get a preliminary uh, idea of what you want to find out using this uh, Weixin.Sogo, which like really is really important because there is really a lot on stuff on WeChat. And like, for example, certain government organization, if they have like a new regulation coming out, they might first post it on the WeChat account, public account, and later on on the website. So you really want to keep in mind on WeChat because there is really, really important stuff. 
uh, going on there. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just want quickly to add something on this. This is very useful for us all, uh, even if you're not working directly on China, but on Chinese influence in Europe, for example, or Chinese influence uh, anywhere in the world, you will have access to article would be like destroyed in China instantly, but still exist on WeChat because it's talking about other countries. For example, if you want to know uh, which people from the community of the outside world, uh, outside China are doing some influence for China in, the, in Europe, for example, you will definitely find the names on this uh, search engine with the videos and everything. So this is really something to keep in mind. And I, I will just to jump in on, on the last thing you said. Uh, if you want to have like uh, accounts to have access to this kind of services, you're supposed to be a Chinese, an elder Chinese to access. Now it's more possible than ever because of the children of China who cannot access to the video games because of the new regulations. So they are like looking for fake identities on the web in China and there is a lot of hackers that are really happy to provide them with these fake identities. So you just have to pretend to be a children. In China, I want to play video games at night and you will be like a brand new person in China with a full identity and able to access all these services. <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds weird to say about children, but like, like for the context, basically a year or two years ago, the Chinese government decided that like playing Fortnite all night wasn't good. So they tried to put like some system to block kids, I think under like 13 or whatever, to have more than two hours of video game. And so uh, you had to register with your ID. I mean, one thing again, like for those of you that have been a bit on China, for a lot of these services, you have to have like a Chinese phone number and your Chinese phone number is linked to your ID. I mean, my Chinese phone number uh, is linked to my passport and every time I change it, I have a new one and like I just, like I could, uh, but like it's, you know, like if I'm just going there like on, on a research trip for, for like my, my PhD, I'm not gonna like start to try to have a fake like number or whatever. Point is like for most people, your phone number is linked to your ID. And that's how they try to make it for the, for the children and so on, and that's hence what Noe just said right now. But let's continue, and I want to introduce you one last platform, which is Zhuhu, which is basically Quora, but I'm gonna show you why Zhuhu is like very, 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 very useful. It's because it's basically lists of lists. It's like, just like Quora. You have like a question, so like this one is about like uh, the violence in France that, um, well, you might have heard of uh, lately. And so yeah, now they're having debates about it, and, um, and I mean, there's like, Whatever, we, I'm not gonna go into this. But the point is that like, um, Zhuhu is very useful, and I'm gonna show you why. Because now I wanna give you a few ideas of Chinese government databases. So like, for example, I'm gonna click, where is my thing here? So this is the central government, open government uh, database. So you arrive there, so, oh well, like very nice, like for when it works pretty well, which is pretty good. It's central government, so it's fine. Um, and so here is like, lists of documents, so you have a search engine, you, send, you can have like just the title or the full text uh, to search in the title or in the full text. Uh, if you want like things that are related to this or like the exact things you typed in. Uh, and then like the, uh, if you want to have it like sorted by relevance or time. Uh, but then what's interesting is that like you can actually have like all these things on the, on the, on the side. Um, so that's where we are. You can have like some of the, uh, you can have, what is this? Yeah, this is like the yearly records from the government. This is very interesting. In France, we have the journal officiel. Well, know that in China, they have like also a journal officiel that is not, we, that is also like uh, more or less every 10 day. And you know, if you want to know some stuff, like this is in English and, and this is the journal officiel, the Chinese journal officiel, you know, like, and I feel that most people didn't know that they existed. But yeah, and like, if you click on it, this is like, this is meant to be accessible. So yeah, okay, well, uh, you know, the, oh wait, this one did, uh, did, this one like didn't work out, but like, you know, well, that's what they put out, you know, like decree for the, this, and like, this is not even in Chinese, this is in English, right? Now, like, this is like beginner of beginner level. Uh, but yeah you just have to know where to look at. And that's always the same with China. Uh, it's just to know where you're looking at. But yeah, uh, this is a bit like a kind of the appetizer. Because then, when I say Joe is your friend, it's like, when I was preparing this, I was like, okay, um, I know government open. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, désolé, du coup, uh, est-ce qu'il est possible, enfin, est-ce que tu as déjà vu des cas où uh, la Chine a fait de la rétention d'informations sur les pages en anglais, ou uh, la modification d'informations yeah, uh, whether China uh, basically 
hide some information like from the Chinese to the English or if the information is different or uh, if uh, you don't, uh, yeah, if you can't access something, like if, you, if for some things you have to find it in Chinese and the answer is of course yes. Um, I mean, some things are just not published in English. I mean, to be honest, besides the central government and a few government administrations that deal with foreigners a lot, many administrations just don't publish in English. I mean, why would they? Like, this, like that's not even, you know, it's like, it's like if, uh, if uh, I don't know, like I would have say I come up again with La Caf, but that's not necessarily the best example. <laughs> but just like, uh, yeah, like sometimes, it's, you know, it's like they don't, they don't do it. Um, so, yeah, sure, good. Yeah, uh, the best example for this? Yeah, the best example for this is um, Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs. Uh, it does the, the publication in English and in Chinese, and sometimes there are some questions in English that doesn't appear. But you can find them in, in Chinese. It does appear. So this is very obvious. Uh, this is very easy to, yeah, to ascertain, but yeah. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. Is there any other question right now, or do you want like to, to, to continue a bit? Yeah, yeah, there's another one. We have like still 45 minutes, so I think we, we can have time because there is not like, yeah. yeah sorry, again me. Um, is it like the French Journal Officiel where you can find names uh, of uh, each uh, military guys, each uh, promotion, all that kind of stuff? There is a lot of details or not that much because I guess there is a lot of people uh, in each uh, in each military mm. teams, I mean, you understand? Yeah, uh, I think that like, so I, I'll confess, I don't use this journal officiel uh, all the time, but like, I know that these like are on other newspapers, uh, but I get, yeah, there, there are nominations in there for sure. But then some of the nominations, you can find it on the official website as well. Uh, I guess it, it depends. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you can find them. You. Anything else? Yeah, sure. You were talking earlier about the fact that you need an ID that's tied to a phone number in China. I was wondering if you could get prepaid SIM cards, things like that, that without necessarily it being tied to an ID to do some research and register on some websites. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can basically get anything. Uh, yeah, and it's quite easy because it's accessible to anyone in China. Like, uh, it's a very deep concern for many Chinese citizens to bypass and not appear with their own identity or SIM card. And SIM card, like, it's basically the the, the basic way to identify itself, uh, himself. So, so yeah, it's it's easy to to find actually with some keywords on even Google or Twitter. You ca you can find people able to sell you anything you want. Identity, SIM card, prepare SIM cards, and uh, even some uh, accounts with a lot of friends, and even like high-ranked friends if you want. So, yeah, <laughs> you okay, can. Thanks. And yeah. do the yes, we SIM can. cards work from abroad as well, or? SIM cards yeah. from China. Not from, you can't get a Chinese phone number that receives text messages and stuff in France, for example. Oh, <laughs> you, uh, I, I, okay, uh, I misunderstood. I think like uh, you will not, uh, I, I don't think they will do the delivery. <laughs> yeah, you, you will get the number and you will be able to use the number, but you will not get like the physical thing, I think. But I say that because I never buy, bought one, but I'm pretty sure it's quite easy to get it delivered if you need, and you can ask it in Chinese. Like uh, there, it is not settled. Like it is not like this. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll just give you an example. Like I was, in, I was in China beginning of June. Um, you arrive at the airport. You go to the tourist thing at the airport. You buy a SIM card, and I'm just gonna show you what it happens because, like, it, I found it very funny. Basically, this company is built buying SIM cards, and what they just did is taking a picture of my passport. But then, like, you're just like. I mean, how much are they actually going to do? Like, I, I'm a foreigner, you know, when you're a foreigner, you know you're going to be more kept in check. But still, like, what's the thing? If you just go there, you just buy a SIM card that has been bought by a company, and they just take a picture of your passport to register you later on? I mean, you know, you can already see gaps in the system like this. And for example, if, let's say, you have a, a SIM card that your friend, like, through Alipay, 
uh, if you have an ID number, there is like, I, I can't show you this on the computer, unfortunately, but like through Alipay, you can buy SIM cards. Um, of course, they need to be delivered somewhere, but like you can buy the SIM card. If, let's say you have like an ID number that is valid. You buy a SIM card, uh, you get it delivered, and then you just top it up every month with like 20 or 30 Jaminbi, like four or five euros, I don't know. Uh, yeah, three or four euros, two or three euros. And, uh, and you keep the card alive. That could work. The only thing is that it's tricky because in, indeed, I mean, we were lucky to at some point go to China and then buying cards there and then bringing them back to Europe and, and maintaining them alive from Europe. But I, I, don't, I can't answer really on whether you can them deliver it or not. But as Noe said, I'm pretty sure that is, <laughs> that is possible. <laughs> Should we proceed, or is there anything else? All right. So yeah. So I said Joe is your friend because when I was preparing this presentation, I was like, hey, um, I'd like to find a bit of this uh, more of this open data. If there is lists of lists. So what I did, I went on Joe and I just like typed, hey, is there something about like open data? And so I got on this link that is a pretty recent one. So yeah, you're supposed to register, but here you don't need. Um, and uh, here, like, okay, uh, these are all different administrations. So this is. Um, this is like, for example, the second one is the forestry administration. Spoiler, it already doesn't work. Don't ask me why. I don't know if it's a geoblock or not, but like some of them doesn't work. I tried the, where is it? The meteorological data, but this one is of course like you have to register to access, to access meteorological data. But then you have all these government, this is like provincial government. So this is Sichuan, this is Beijing, this is Tianjin, this is Shanghai. And for all of them, well, this is just like the open data uh, website. So like if you go, if I go on, uh, Tianjin, yeah, you went on Tianjin, yeah, okay, you get out of Zhuhu. Yeah, right, and this is like open data website, so I don't know, like these are all thematic things like Xinyong, okay, that's like social credit, that's what I do, but then like you can have like medical stuff, you have like public security, you have like, uh, I like, I take stuff, so like you can like download this, which is like this uh, registry entry, and you have like all these projects that are like uh, getting to this, okay, oh, like there's like some new thing coming up. I mean, these are all projects of stuff that exist that you can have like in XLS data. And I didn't try every of them, obviously, but I know that for many of them, you can really access it without even registering. So whether, you know, like this is, for example, uh, small and SME, small and medium enterprise, like technological companies that like get entered into the database. This is all pretty recent, like, right? Like this, like, this was updated like a few days ago, like, like at the beginning of this month. So, you know, point is, and this is only one, one city, this is just Tianjin, right? Uh, I mean, uh, like maybe I can do this a bit better. Um, so we see a bit. But like this is one city and there and there's plenty of this. Like there is plenty of plenty of plenty of this stuff. Like I'm gonna show you other example because I know you, you, you want more example. La later, oh, this is there. I'm gonna go to, to, I'm gonna do this first Guangdong. Let's go to Guangdong. I'm gonna show you how it works. So this is Guangdong province government uh, website. So I'm going here, huh? very beautiful. Uh, here, open uh, government. All right, so this is like all the leaders. You can write a message to your uh, provincial leader if you want. Um, we actually checked this before and there was like, yeah, people writing to it. So just a formula, yeah, it's just like a thing you can like, if you could, no, I mean, we don't have enough time for this. But, just, <laughs> but yeah, so here, for example, get something interesting, right? Because we, we start to have some stuff. Uh, this is like uh, this is like some of the obligation thing. This is like okay. Oh, oh wait, wait, that's that's oh, it's a variation from uh, open data. It's like data release basically, but it is open data. Um, and here, oh wow, hey, that's like welcome to the Guangdong Province uh, open data database. You know, and well, again, you have all these things that like. Here you go, like, oh, I want something about environmental protection. So, oh, hey, I can even check what kind of data do I want. And, you know, like, this is uh, Zhao Qing, which is a city. So Zhao Qing, oh, wait, this is like, uh, this is the information on administrative penalties given by the Bureau, the, the Bureau, yeah, but like, I'm just like, like you know, that you're right, right. Guangning Sub Bureau of the uh, Zhao Qing City Environmental Protection Bureau. But, yeah, point is that, you know, this is truth of data. And like, I'm sure many of you have like already many ideas to stuff to look at all this. And I'm sure you do. But again, 
It's about in the way you look, right? Like it's it's about and and this is I mean this is all like administrative penalties and yes like if you click on this like I'm sure that there's gonna be like just list of saying X company got an administrative penalty because blah blah blah, but you know that might help. So you can have like thematic, but you can have like of course like uh, different types of like uh, this is like yeah uh, another kind of thematic like uh, higher education, transportation, uh, health, citizen service. This is latest data set that has been out, and to be honest, like it's just a playground. Like you know, latest API. Like like this is like for every time I work on this kind of stuff, I always find out something new because there's just so much. And to be honest, I'm sure that like most of Chinese people don't have no as well. Yeah. I have a question. Um, is it uh, possible, for example, if I perform like Google Docs but on Baidu? Do I find the do by do monitor all that kind of stuff and it will show me that uh, that data or I absolutely need to go on the search engine of uh, gdata dot and, and and so on? And, uh, that's a good question because like I've done I've done it Baidu but like I was never very satisfied about Baidu so I already there usually do it on Google because it's already is also available on Google to be honest for some of this and uh, and maybe I'll show you later but I'm sure that many of you in this room don't need it but actually there is like a small crawler that you can download from the Chinese internet that does very well on Chinese government pages because like this is this is yeah this is very this is very 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 easy to use but anyway this is just Guangdong and uh, I mean I'm gonna check uh, yeah. So like, this is what we just see. And on, da on government data, always go at the footer of a website. Because, I'm gonna show you why. Here, for example, you have here, oh, like there's like other database. So this is Guangdong Social Credit. I have something on Social Credit at the end, but like I may not go through it because then it's that interesting. This is like Guangdong Data uh, Stock Exchange. And this is like, um, construction industry like data open so like then you can have like data on like uh, on like infrastructure projects going on but you know always go at the footer because you will always find something so they say that they have like like 128,000 data on, on companies or whatever but there is always stuff to look out like to be on like if I have to be 100% honest with you I don't know all of what's on the Guangdong provincial government website <laughs> because like I mean you know we have jobs <laughs> like like I just don't I can't spend all my time on this although it's a really much of a rabbit hole um, <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know this is like this is more related to my work like this is like companies who have been behaving in an untrustworthy way so I don't know I, I'm seriously randomly clicking here um, I don't know there's like this company that is doing like m uh, machinery so yeah, okay, social credit score. I'm gonna come back to this later. So this is the guy that is the registered person of this company, right? They have a they have a, a, a security license that has been delivered there. Okay, what's going on else? Wow, well, not that much information. Yeah, okay, they are, they did something. Oh, they did actually something. Yeah, interesting. I actually went to Guangzhou and they are doing a new terminal at the airport. And apparently, this guy did something wrong on the on the work because they have a untrustworthy behavior here. Yeah, they got like, I think security regulation or something. But yeah, you know, like I've been, and, and they got a fine. All right, okay. Like, look, I, like this is just saying you that like, if I just randomly click on stuff, you can already find a lot of things on the Chinese internet. Of course, this requires a bit of language skills, but to be honest with a control F and your good keywords, yeah, you can already do some stuff. And otherwise we're here, you know, like that's also what we do. Uh, but anyway, uh, oh, oh, this of course you're gonna love it because government programming databases, so, <laughs> of course, like people are going to be interested by this. Um, yeah, that's like things that exist around, around the Chinese internet. So, I don't know, like this is uh, just like if you click on the first thing, this is government expenditures for the month of April uh, by the Ministry of Finance. Um, and then all of these are databases. So, on Firefox, this website is painstakingly long to load. It's horrible, so I have to be careful in what I want to click on. Um, but yeah, um, this is like announcement. This is like uh, procurement contracts that have been seriously untrustworthy. That would be basically like corruption thingy. Um, this is like uh, accredited third party to be to act as like a representative in government uh, contract. This is like also uh, a way to look at uh, of the of the government. Um, uh, yeah, this is like the, the search engine for looking at the at the opening of uh, government uh, projects. Yeah, like some standards on wage or whatever. Like, I mean, there is like there is really a lot of things, right? I mean, 
there's really a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> like when, when sometimes I look at it, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to wake up tomorrow, like to to to, to look at all of this stuff. But yeah, I don't know. Like, um, I think I did something in the PPT. I don't have to type it directly. But yeah, I typed. Oh, I went to the untrustworthy one. So this is like for company that did some unt untrustworthy stuff. So yeah, like this is just list, right? Again, as usual, company's name, uh, social credit number. So if you have a question about social credit, I'm gonna answer it later. This is really late. This is a bit like un, uh, uh, too close. Hmm? With beers, yes, that's too close to home. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But basically, know that every company in China has a unique social credit number that is their identifier. And basically, for people, this number is their ID number. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's the number. So you can find always companies from this number or from the name. Uh, although the name is sometimes tricky because like big companies have like sub-branches in all the provinces, and that can like, really troublesome. Um, yeah, this is like another thing. So like this is for my research, for example. I looked at like, okay, what are the latest projects uh, related to social credit, for example? Uh, and I just, you know, I, I really randomly typed this, right? I wasn't really doing like uh, very specific. And yeah, like, okay, like there's like some programs like for um, uh, experimental uh, project for social credit in whatever city. And so if you click on it, for example, you have this kind of documents. So Zhongbiao, this is like, this has been given already, right? They already won the contract. Like one company won the contract already which is this company here. Um, and so you can assign, okay, that was the value of the contract. Uh, you can see who are the people that have been like, uh, like written on this. So, you know, like I'm sure that many of you guys, like this, you see this kind of stuff and like, okay, mm, there's already like stuff I can do with that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, right, this is just like one, and this is really just like random search. If you have like more precise keywords, like give them to us, we're gonna have fun. Um, okay, yeah. Questions first, because then after it's gonna be social credit. And uh, and like, yeah, uh, social credit has also like many databases, but let's take some questions first. Don't be shy. Oh, I think like, <laughs> Kamarad is like, yeah. If I understand well, uh, the Chinese internet is like the Russian one. You, I mean, the Russian one, you can find a lot of Telegram bots with uh, some, uh, some euros. You can have a lot of, uh, of data with corruption or that kind of stuff. Is it the same for, for the Chinese? Because you show only open data now. Uh, but uh, there is also a corruption, for example, of people who are selling, I don't know, on WeChat or that kind of stuff, uh, a lot of information. Thank oh. you. The, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, question is yes, of course. Like on WeChat, on Taobao, which is like the Alibaba shop. I mean, no one said this. Like, they usually like the funny thing is like if you want to get this information that is a bit like tricky to sell, you know, to say like shady. Um, what governments do, like what sellers do, is that they use like different words in Chinese to refer to this. Uh, like for example, um, what was it? No, it was the shaming. Uh, you know, like the, I remember we, we worked on this at some point. They did like for this like real name authentication. I think that they use like different characters that were saying like uh, real time instead of uh, of like real life or something like this. Yeah, like point is, it's like it's a bit of a language play, but you can always find it. And payment wise, I don't know if they accept like uh, a wire from. I mean, they they do find something. <laughs> Just like I, I'm sure of it. Sure, I see there's a question there. Um, you said before, then the government uh, do a a lot of censorship and decide uh, what is uh, going to be public or not. Uh, can you give us a bit of relief about uh, which information uh, shared by, as an open data by uh, local government was finally decided to be not uh, public source by the central government, uh, if you have any example? Uh, there, is a couple of, there is one example very recent. Um, the Ministry of Statistics usually publishes like, well, I mean, just like in the West, data on, on population, right? And um, in April, I think, no, in April, I don't know, in the latest report, I don't know when it was out, like Mar, like May or whatever, suddenly there were no information in neither central nor local governments. There was no information about, uh, is, how do you call it, like cremation. How many people were cremated in the country? Yeah, because there was like data on the last semester of 2022, which was the peak of COVID in China. So they were like, ah, no, <laughs> you're not gonna know how many people died and were cremated. <laughs> you're not gonna decide that. So yeah, so it changed a lot. Uh, it changed a lot. 
uh, I find it sometimes, like when I do my own research, um, that like some data on, I don't know, uh, if you start to look at certain types of companies, state-owned companies that might do some business, I'm not going to find a, bit, a lot of information of this. But this is, this is always changing. And sometimes you find information on local government database that you don't. Also, it might come from government... Uh, instructions not to publish this and it might come I have an example later on social credit um, when I was like using the database for social organization that is NGOs um, I realized that like for example on the national database there was no information from association from Shanghai it's like wait that's weird and then later on I went on the Shanghai uh, database and there all the information was there and it was just a typical example of like administration not sharing to each other. It meant that Shanghai didn't bother send the data to the central government. They're like, nah, nah, we don't care. And just like, like that is, so all this, you know, we, you, of course, the list of what is publishable and not publishable is never open. That's the point. Uh, but sometimes you find out that some information disappear. And you're like, ah, fuck, I should have like archived this. <laughs> just like that's yeah. <laughs> that's what we do, yeah. I hope that answered somehow part of your question. Anything else? Well, um, I don't know. Like we have uh, half an hour left, so next part is about social credit. But the thing is, like, this is a bit of my what I do my research on, and I can skip a bit of the talk about it and go directly to some of the social credit database. Um, but like, I I'll just do very briefly social credit. If you see this, don't believe it. There is no score for Chinese people. Just stop, period, no, forget this. Like nobody has a score that is like deciding his life. No, seriously, because this is like really, really troublesome to hear this. There is no score. Uh, social credit isn't like whatever, some uh, mass tool for surveillance. This has nothing to do with it. It's not constantly monitoring behaviors. So really like this social credit is not this. What social credit is, and I'm gonna go directly to this, is like the backbone of uh, data digitalization and uh, the digital backbone of the state in like, what the Chinese government did with social credit over the last 10 years is that they built part of all this database that we just saw. And that, that was actually social credit. That is like, they created a framework to classify data. I'm not gonna go into details. It's called like public information data or like market information, credit information data, it doesn't matter. Point is that they created all these frameworks and all the databases and now they connect to each other to see the idea that, okay, we can exchange information among administration um, we have like more visibility in, on everything. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. I'm just moving too much. Um, it's just me being overexcited by my topic, obviously. <laughs> like imagine there's never been that many people willing to hear about social credit in the room. <laughs> just, like, no, I'm just joking, I mean, halfly. But anyway, um, let's go what the people here. So this is one, um, you're gonna love that website. So this is the, the list that you've heard about because this is, oh wait, what, seriously? No, it should work. Uh, it's probably because there's like, this website should work. Um, um, this, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanna find it. Because this one is like all the individuals. Uh, where are you? Uh, why is it not working? Anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm getting lazy. Uh, point is, like, when you go on this website, so it's like, I could type this, like, uh, the Supreme Court, like, Shusin, Beijing, Haimingnan, whatever. Um, you arrive on this, in which you can type a name. So in my case, I just type, like, Zhou Chen, Zhou Chen, which is, like, a random name, really random. And I didn't put anything else, no ID number, the second line, no organization number, no province. You just enter the, the verification code, and then you get, Boom, you get this. So these, all, are, all these guys are named Zhou Chen, uh, and they have been entered on this blacklist. And so if you click on the details on the right, you can have this kind of stuff. So this guy, who is a man, and you have like most of his ID number. Like seriously, this is the, the third line. It's like most of his ID number, right? Like it's just like they just kept a few numbers out. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, excuse me, I wasn't here from the beginning, but... Um, I once read a story about a woman who wanted to leave the country uh, and the um, authorization was denied because she didn't have a good score. 
So you're telling me that the kind of story is bullshit? Yeah, I, I, like if she was really forbidden from getting out of the country, I'm pretty sure there was another reason. And it might not be political. It might just be that, like, yeah. I don't know, like she didn't have enough money on her. On, on like, you know, like Chinese authorities don't really want people to just go abroad, like for no reason okay, ish it's a political question not just a question of score or... no the, the score question no like like i mean this 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 doesn't happen like really this is like i, I don't. so there is this thing this is supposed to i'm going to show you like a counter example uh, to why this list is supposed if you get on this list you're supposed to be banned from flying and you're supposed to be banned from taking the tgv the high speed train right um, but like last year in june 2022 in a city in china uh, a group of guys beat the beat out a woman uh, in front of every p a a other people like in a restaurant like 10 guys walked into a restaurant grabbed the woman by the hair and like like beat her to the point that she had to go to the hospital in front of everybody and so this was national scandal for obvious reason and um when they started to inquire about who was the perpetrator of this there was like local mafia or whatever guy has been seven times on this blacklist and he was still like being the local mafia boss so <laughs> you. you know just like this is this is to say that Again, enforcement, this, this is a bit like also a bit of this administrative thing. It's like, for example, I'm just going to do a small parenthesis because I think that's going to be interesting. If you go to a court in China and you want to like sue someone or sue another company, um, and the guy decides, like, this list was created precisely for that reason. Nui owes me money. I go to a court uh, to sue him. The court say he should pay. Well, if I don't pay the court to send a guy to find Nui to give me the money, he just can not pay me, nothing's gonna happen. And you have to pay the court to actually like, uh, s the court send a car to go to pick the guy. Because like, there's just too much case, there's just not many, just not enough money in the judicial system. And, and yeah, and like for all this small petty case of like money, like I know people, I mean, I know people, not personally, but like friends, literally like second circle of friends that have been, living by taking small loans and never repaying them. And they drive in AMG and they just like, you know, have fun in the, in the countryside. So this is to say that for all this social credit thing, what I'm just showing you right now, in real life, it doesn't really work. I mean, it work, like, of course, if like the states wants to find you, uh, they're gonna do it, no problem. And that's always what I say in conferences is that like, Chinese, like the Chinese state doesn't need social credit to repress people, like, I mean, seriously, like they, they can do it very much without it. Um, this is really about having digital information more than just enforcement. I mean, they use it for enforcement, but it's very dependent on the local cases. But yeah, uh, on, this bla on this list, anyway, like keep the website. Uh, like if you just type the Chinese, you're gonna find directly on the website. Um, and this, you don't need any verification code and you get access to lists just like that, you know? Like, and this is only one part of it because actually you have more. Uh, that just shows like, yeah, like uh, what precisely what the court order and like in this case the guy like didn't pay his debt or whatever. I mean, yeah, he like he was owning, he was not even owning that much. He was only like basically a bit more than 10k euro. That's it. Yeah. He, he had to pay 10k euro and like he didn't. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So Credit China is the main social credit database. Uh, oh, this I was, I was even like, I was not, I, I, I got like fine enough to just translate what each of these mean. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so, Credit China, sure, check if my cyber is, if my brother is safe. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, so this is the website, this is the search bar, um, yeah, um, if you go a bit down there, you have all these different kind of basically lists that you can find. So this is like the serious trustworthy or whatever. And like, this is really, if you have a social security, like if you have a, so a social credit number, you're gonna type it and you're gonna have like results on uh, a specific company. But this is pretty much a bit of the same thing. Yeah, that's what it looks like. So I don't know, I just type some random company, don't ask me why. Uh, and you can see here that like, uh, this guy is like 11 serious and trustworthy recording. And but at the same time, they still kept one. They kept one social good, good like they honored the contract once. So 11 to one, like, I don't know, sounds like a good ratio to me, but just like, that's a bit what the list look like. So again, name of the company, like the different like kind of administration, like if they, if they have like uh, administrative proceedings, uh, irregular information or whatever, but that's like what it looks like and that's what it is. This is another platform because yeah, this is the beautiful thing about China. Remember the thing about silos, right? That I said at the beginning. So this, 
is coming from uh, this one is coming from one administration, Credit China, that is the NDRC, that is the State Council. Uh, it would be like kind of the office of the Prime Minister, so to say, in France. Um, and so they have their own database, right? But then you have these guys that are actually the equivalent of like Bercy, I would say, so to say, like a sub of Bercy, and they have their own database. And guess what? They don't share the data. <laughs> I mean. It's not even like based on what I heard. I don't even I don't even know if it's the data are like are like compatible in the formatting or whatever. So you just have like two silos. And yeah, well that's another database. And good luck for us. This one is a bit like you, you can access quite a, a few stuff on this one. So like this is another company that I chose there. I mean this is like Societe.com Chinese version basically. But like yeah, you, you still like find some stuff that might be useful for for some of you. Um, and this is again this is like it's like literally three clicks away. I'm like, you know, I'm not like showing, like this is really like free clicks. Uh, if you have a name of a company, this is free clicks. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the, the thing, like if like, so they, they, they have like, even like they have like a, a hot topic. So like I click on a company. Uh, these guys are doing car rental apparently or something. Um, do we have anything? Nah, not very interesting. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're gonna be, oh yes, there's some stuff. So they have like uh, administrative information I don't even know what that is. Like, you know, like I'm looking at the same time. Oh, registration. Wait, there is like 60 pages. Holy shit. Is it like all the people that rented the car ever? <laughs> I don't even know. I'm just like, I don't even know. Like, I'm just like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a lot of stuff. But, you know, point is, is like, no, there's nothing here. They haven't been uh, added to anything. Uh, have, they, have they been untrustworthy? They've never been untrustworthy. But, yeah, point is, this is what the, 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 the thing looks like. I thought you had a question, but no. All right, I feel very sad right now. Um, now I'm gonna continue. This is the last one uh, on associations because there's NGOs in China. So, um, I mean, yeah, well, they are NGOs, but you know, it's tricky. Um, and like, I don't know, uh, we did a test. Like, let's say, let's find someone that are untrustworthy as usual. Um, and let's find something. What did we type before? Uh, oh, we typed like, uh, yeah, sir, like plastic surgery. Um, <laughs> Oh, wow, this is a very difficult CAPTCHA. Um, oh, I, I was actually surprised when I prepared the presentation. One website asked me a CAPTCHA that was like free Chinese word and you had to put them in order. And this was like, oh, wow, I was a bit surprised. You know, it's the first time I had this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I typed it. And so all these are seriously untrustworthy organizations. So first one is like organization, like a, a school that is teaching plastic surgery skills. Uh, I mean, there's like plenty of them, but the point is like, it's usually the same thing, right? You go here. And you have like your information, um, like on the num first thing, the number of the, 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 the registration number of the associations, what kind of industry they are, the guy that is the head of it, and you know, like the city, uh, the subunit, like you can even have like the, the address of the, of the thing. I mean, yeah. And so, yeah, that is to say that there's like, this is also like very three clicks achievable thing. As long as you have a name or something, you can find out. Yeah, that was an example I, I took over. Mm, yeah, that's like, well, this is something like, because, you know, there's like many companies, like uh, IT chat, that was like a subunit of Baidu that would allow you to check like uh, corporate records from companies and especially uh, like the, the shareholders and so on. But like this gets a lot of, of geoblock. So like this is also one of your question before. Um, yeah, they don't really like us to go dig into the shareholding structures of some companies. I mean, at least you have to be either to have a VPN or like to have an access to see this kind of stuff. They don't really like it. Yeah, and then there's like lastly because like see like I know it's getting hard, it's getting late, but yeah, uh, CNKI. This is like for uh, academic papers, so you wouldn't be able to access the full paper because you need to uh, to have an access for that. But you can still like see names and stuff like this. So this is just like. Um, What's the name uh, in French? Like, uh, no, the the French one. I know. I always forget. Wait, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I forgot. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, like, this is just academic paper database, right? So, like, you have an advanced search uh, by topics, by uh, uh, by title, sorry, uh, by the abstract, by the keywords, by uh, by yeah, by like offers to like all text and so on. That can be useful. This is really funny, but this is for like the big nerds of you. Uh, this is like the intra-party regulations. 
<laughs> if like this is like the, how, the, how the party govern itself. So basically, how it tells cadres to behave. And so there is a website for that also with database of intra-party regulations. You know, because yeah, like uh, that's that's always nice free reports because like there are many reports that are like done by corporate clients in China that like get online for free. And you know, like I, we, we, like I tried it like a couple of times. You have like a, a report on something you want, whatever industry, you might find it for free on this website. Might be useful. Uh, and lastly, and again, like I could have gone longer, but I didn't have like that much time to prepare in this presentation, but it is standards. So standardization. So like I'm gonna go on the website for this one. Um, I'm sure. That's not said, honestly. <laughs> yeah, so this is just like all standards of, I don't know, just plenty of stuff. Like on the, on the health administration, you can see what is the latest work report. You can see like uh, different industry standards that is being discussed. Uh, yeah, well, see, hmm, this is going to be fun. Are they blocking this now? Last time I tried it, it wasn't blocked. Um, I don't know, it just depends on some stuff. But like point is like, you have access to really love the, oh, like, that's like foreign standards, like trials, you know, standards can be very useful also if you work in like tech sector, um, like, or, like it did like, for example, like, I'm just gonna say randomly when they try to standardize something about like risk five or whatever, like uh, CP, like uh, open source architecture things, you would see who is involved in what on this. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, Noe, you want to add something? Because I think that after that, yeah. Yeah, I just want to quickly add something for people amongst you that want to investigate in China, maybe. Uh, there is like very good database uh, my colleague just presented, but there is one big database, uh, which is Internet 1.0, actually, still existing in China. Because forums were a very popular way to communicate and to exchange information before. And as it was stated before, uh, censorship is not that efficient in China. And now this is private companies that are censoring contents. So content that have been posted before, they are going under the censorship. So you have a huge base of information which is in ancient uh, forums, which were extremely popular. And these forums, people that to post something, they had to identify themselves. So you can track them back now. And some of these people that were posting things on forums that are really spe specified, like uh, in cybersecurity, for example, you can tra trace them back through their profile on these forums. This is how, for example, we found people uh, which became uh, like uh, people that now are uh, making the whole cybersecurity system in China because they were posting as like little hackers on the very 2,000 uh, years uh, things on forums that have been forgotten now, that you can still find them. So this is something you really have to keep in mind, I think, like to be able to dig into the very <laughs> depth of the Chinese internet, you will find like very precious information and contacts. That you can like trace back this contact through the to the WeChat of these people now that so you will never have access to them otherwise. Yeah, this is uh, the last uh, advice I would give. Great. Thanks. Oh. Thank you very much. Please applause them. Seriously, guys, you have you are very cool to to give that kind of workshops uh, till one uh, one a.m. Uh, Saturday night. Yeah, I'd like to say that the room was like fuller when we started, though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're passionate about China. Uh, we have time for some questions, but don't worry, you don't have to 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 stand up. I I can come with the microphones. It's not necessary. Uh, I have just one question or just one demand if you agree. You went on this presentation with many captions and memes. Can you, if you agree, explain some of them? Uh, which one? Yeah. Uh, those of the first uh, slides, like um, before, before. Yeah, those one. Uh, don't pass your exam, go home, eat. <laughs> That's what it says. Like, like they're basically like, yeah, made fun of this kind of stuff. Uh, what else do they add? Um, 
Yeah, like if you have to be a person like Suarez, like be a be a real man or real be a person, so to say, be that kind of person. Like be a good communist, basically. But this is also very ironic, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, this is like about uh, when your own time is becoming more and more uh, less because you're like not finishing writing your PPT and you haven't been uh, finishing on time. And I think this one is pretty good to show the existential dread of Chinese youth. <laughs> Other questions? Well, yep, I'm coming. Bonsoir, merci pour la présentation. J'ai une question, est-ce que vous commencez à avoir de la limite au niveau de la publication des données suite à ce que la Russie a commencé à engager aussi quand elle a vu qu'on utilisait leur base de données pour faire des recherches contre eux Pour la Chine, du coup, est-ce que vous voyez le même phénomène Yeah, whether we've seen uh, basically China limiting access to some databases or some, like, to some public information following uh, what we've has been going on in Russia when we've been un uh, uncovering some stuff. I mean, yes, and uh, it has been international news when like two US companies got uh, raided, I mean three I think, or two or three US, like got raided in China because they were doing due diligence work uh, with Chinese employees in China and the state just raided them. I mean one of them was quite extreme, they were literally like paying and calling people in state, in military companies to inform the foreigners and what was going on in the company. Like I mean this was like very borderline spying, but the other one was just intimidation, it was just like hey uh, stop doing this kind of research. Euh, en français, vite fait, euh, pour que ce soit plus simple pour moi. Euh, on a parlé de CNKI, par exemple, la, la plateforme d'échange académique. Euh, cette année, l'État a décidé de vraiment briser les genoux de cette entreprise. Euh, elle est toujours accessible, mais il y a eu quand même une certaine purge des documents, euh, notamment ceux qui étaient de sécurité nationale selon le gouvernement. Euh, et euh, et c'est quelque... oui, donc c'est un phénomène qui existe aussi en Chine. Between um, geo-blocking, like just not having access to information, and what you discussed earlier with uh, English translation not being consistent with the Chinese document, are you also looking to see if what you see when you visit a website from a French IP is the same as when you visit it with an IP coming from mainland China? Yeah, usually, I mean, except on specific things, like they really, they, they would more not bother like changing the content and just like straight out blocking you. Yeah, yeah I, I think you have to keep in mind that it's not that efficient, like uh, the way they're acting. Like uh, maybe you can imagine a lot of very clever way to hide information or be very nimble with information, but they will probably not use them. So you will always go back to the very simple solution. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, our VPNs from Hong Kong blocked in for uh, blocked accessing websites in China. Yes. Or Taiwan. Yes. <laughs> Answer is yes. Uh, you cannot use like Hong Kong, like VPN in Hong Kong, to access something in mainland doesn't work. And Taiwan. Ah uh, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Do not hesitate because there is a lot of stuff that Estes Red know that they did don't disclose, so they have they provide also trainings, I guess. Guys, you provide trainings, yeah, right? So do not hesitate to contact them for trainings, for watch. Do you do not hesitate to to follow them on the all the social networks. They are doing a very good job on the free newsletters and the paid newsletters. And seriously, watch all the documentaries uh, for they, they done like uh, in French, Les Nouveaux Soldats de la Chine, in, uh, in English, I don't know, in, or in German. Yeah. No, I don't know, yeah, but uh, you, you will find, like, basically, I think we, we got involved in most of the Chinese related uh, documentary in Arte, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So go on Arte.tv, and uh, there is uh, a lot of, of stuff uh, about that. Guys, again, please thank you, Esther's Red. <laughs>